Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to start the info session in two minutes. So just letting everyone trickle in and then we'll start. Okay, we'll start the info session today. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today, everyone. Uh, my name is Helen. I am the Department of Biomedical Engineering's Academic and Student Affairs Manager. I will be your host today and I am very lucky to be joined by Professor Henry Hess, our Chair of Graduate Studies, Ms. Kristen Henlon, our BME Career Placement Officer, Ms. Julie Han, our admissions operation uh, officer from the school's graduate admissions office, and our current PhD candidates, Ms. Cameron Park and Mr. Navid Devako. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, You're welcome to type in your questions into the Q&A box uh, throughout the webinar. It is located on the bottom of the uh, tool section of this Zoom webinar. And throughout the um, info session, if you have um, any questions, feel free to type it in there. If we feel that the answer to your question will benefit all attendees, or if the question can be better addressed by the presenters, we'll save it for the Q&A period at the end of this presentation. Uh, we will be recording today's webinar and I will be sending you the link to it so that you can review any materials that you might have missed or if you just need a refresher. Um, so without further ado, let me turn the mic over to Professor Henry Hess. So hello everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the department a little bit and we'll start with a movie uh, we made to describe the department. Uh, Kristen, the sound is not on. Still not hearing it. Oh, there we go. We're good. Thank you. Biomedical engineering at Columbia University is highly interdisciplinary and encompasses research expertise across the whole university. Our department also emphasizes solving real-life complex biological and medical problems, in other words, engineering for healthy humanity. A biomedical engineer typically has a, a plethora of skills that span life sciences and biology, traditional engineering. Our people have to have an appreciation for socioeconomical concerns, right? Especially say our teams that are working in low resource settings, but all of our groups have to be cognizant of the entrepreneurial aspects. So a BME is a, is a hybrid engineer. 
Columbia University is uh, fortunate to have a top medical school, so it's an incredibly rich and diverse opportunity to cross-pollinate engineering principles with the needs of medicine. We are in a lab for stem cells and tissue engineering. We are now capable to repair organs and parts of the human body. We are becoming much more sophisticated now with our designs of the biological systems. So you can make a whole set of very small size organs and tissues from an individual on a chip. And you can do testing in a patient-specific way. So when we talk today about precision medicine, this is one of the most effective directions in which this area is going. I'm part of the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia. It's the Mind Brain Behavior Institute, and we're really trying to understand the brain from every possible angle. In my lab, we develop new microscopes and new ways to image the brain and other living tissues. Imaging in particular, biomedical imaging, really spans a huge range of disciplines. And quite uniquely, I think, we extend our techniques quite often into the studies of disease. So we're studying a stroke, we're studying brain development, we're studying Alzheimer's. Neuroscience is continually changing and requires this really rapid uh, adoption and leveraging of new tools. The work that we do is really about trying to work on the cancer problem, and that fits into Columbia Engineering for Humanity. What we do in the lab is try to program bacteria by engineering their DNA, and then we will actually put them together with cancer cells and visualize them under the microscope to see how their interactions behave. And so we are very interested in the process of visualization itself whether it's through the microscope or by staining them in different colors. The visualizations can specifically help inspire new ways to try and detect and treat cancer. All this uh, work is really very heavily based on effective collaboration of people from many different areas because our approach to biology, to tissue engineering, to building new technologies is very holistic. Our faculty are very much engaged with the students. We, we depend upon the students. They're the lifeblood of our laboratories, for example. It allows them to have an impact and actually to affect humanity, to affect patients, to save lives. I've seen our students go on to incredibly diverse careers, um, from medicine to being patent lawyers, to being investors, to working for Doctors Without Borders. And I characterize them as being people who are ready for a challenge, who are ready to say, well, I don't know much about heart valves, but give me a couple of days and I'll read up on it. So that was a nice summary from some of our faculty and highlighting their work. But there are many different directions you can take in our um, program and uh, they're listed here on the slide. Next slide, please. And um, I also want to highlight that we are ranked now as one of the top 10 biomedical engineering programs in the nation, even though we're still relatively small. And we have our faculty are highly recognized. They're very active as entrepreneurs and um, also in the, as scientists. And almost all of them are, of the senior faculty are in the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, which recognizes the top um, biomedical engineers. And the junior faculty regularly get the NSF Career Award. So we are um, a highly successful team. And all of this, the faculty success critically depends on the success of the students, which is equally impressive. Next slide. So at the moment, we have over 150 doctoral students, um, several of whom have received uh, fellowships either from Columbia or from the NSF or um, the Department of Defense. And yeah, we're looking forward to having you join us. 
Next slide, please. And we're also making efforts to create a, a truly welcoming environment for any minority or basically all of our students, no matter um, what race they are, what their sexual orientation is, and whatever their disability status might be, we're actively working to make everybody feel welcome in our department and be included. Thank you. Now I'm handing it over to Ms. Kristen Handlin, our um, career placement officer. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Hest. Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Henlin. I am the career placement officer in the biomedical engineering department. I'm just going to give you guys a bit of information about the resources that are available to you if you are accepted into the program. So given um, the fact that a lot of our PhDs go to many different places, um, my, my support of you um, kind of ranges the, the gamut. So I provide a lot of resume and CV support. Students send me um, the resumes and you have access to um, an AI system that we use to make sure that your resume is going to hopefully get through some of those um, application portals and a lot of those larger um, companies. So I provide um, support in, in editing as well as with your cover letter. Um, I also help students with mock interviews. Um, so more of the behavioral side of the interview practice um, for interview practice. Um, and then I help with job, job seeking support. Um, I also host a range of information sessions as well as networking events virtually um, with a lot of our alumni um, and a lot of our company partners so that students can see what um, our alumni are up to, um, as well as where they can fit within the realm of whether that be life sciences, biotechnology, or whatever space you're interested in getting into after you graduate. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, we, we do have um, a couple job boards online to help students um, to get opportunities that um, relate to their backgrounds. Um, so I have a personal job board that is just for BME students, um, where I post internship and full-time opportunities um, that are organized by region, as well as some international opportunities. And then, as I mentioned, I also host a range of information sessions that are specifically for our students, um, as well as virtual career fairs and collaboration with all of the different programs within the engineering school. Um, and then panel discussions that are really helpful um, with alumni so that students, as I said, can see um, where, where the alumni have gone um, and kind of network with them and get any advice about how to look for opportunities after they graduate. Um, this is just a brief snapshot um, of some of the types of places that our students go after they graduate. Um, there's a mixture of, you know, cancer research centers as well as consulting. We have a lot of students who are interested in that life science consulting space. Um, imaging students, you know, going to some of these larger companies that you will have heard of, um, as well as some startup companies. Um, we have a lot of students who are interested in kind of starting their own thing um, or working in a startup space and gaining uh, a range of skills and then applying those to their own personal projects. Um, so this is just a snapshot of some of the places um, that our students have gone. And then I also wanted to briefly mention something called um, PDL, which stands for Professional Development and Leadership. Um, it is a course that um, our master students are, are, are required to take, but we have the option um, to, to extend it to PhD students if they're interested. And so essentially PDL is just a, is, is, is working to provide you with the skills that you'll need um, in terms of networking and looking for jobs in industry, um, as well as teaching, if that is something you're interested in doing after you graduate. Um, and so the first year of courses is essentially this week long kind of boot camp training um, where they give you skills for micro teaching, um, how to grade, how to hold office hours, um, as well as things about like how to, you know, manage your wellness and healthy living and transitioning into living into in a city if you've never lived there before, um, and kind of best practice on how to create a healthy balance between working as well as living your life. Um, so it's a really wonderful um, resource. It is not mandatory, um, but it is something that is free of cost to our PhD students. And so we really hope you take advantage of it if it, if it is something that interests you. 
So now I'm going to pass this over to um, Helen Chen. She is the um, academic and student affairs manager of our department. Helen, take it away. Thank you, Kristen, for sharing the amazing career resources uh, with our prospective students. Uh, I will now go over our program curriculum requirements, uh, starting with our MS degree. Since applicants admitted into our MS PhD program would need to complete the MS degree requirements first while performing research at their admitted lab um, outside of class time. Uh, so for the MS degree, students complete 30 credits total for the degree. Uh, that's approximately 10 courses. Uh, the BMEN 6003 Computational Modeling of Physiological System course is the only credit-based course um, that is required. You are also required to take a graduate level course from the Applied Math Department at the Engineering School. The four graduate level um, elective course offered by um, BME uh, would also be required. Um, also worthy of mentioning is that two of the uh, four BME electives, as in six credits total, can be master's research credits. You're also required to take two semesters of BMEN 9700, um, which is our BME graduate students uh, seminar series. The course is zero credit and is rated pass fail. Uh, each week we invite a professor from around the country to present at the seminar. It is a great platform for you to learn about the research that's going on in uh, different BME field areas. Uh, the remainder 12 credits can be any graduate level course offered at the engineering school, which means it can be a BME course as well if you would like to take all BME courses only. Uh, we do allow one of the four courses to be outside of the engineering school, uh, but that would require your faculty advisor's approval. Um, next slide. Uh, zooming into our PhD uh, curriculum requirements. So if you have completed the master's um, degree with us, um, the uh, BMEN 6003 course can be replaced by a technical elective. Uh, similarly, if you have completed the applied math requirement uh, while completing your master's degree with us, uh, you can replace that with a technical elective as well. Um, but however, for students coming in uh, with a master's uh, degree from another institution, uh, you would be required to complete nine credits of instructional coursework, uh, which would include the BMEN 6003 class and two graduate level math course. Uh, one has to be from the applied uh, math department. And then the remainder, oops, can you go back one? Thank you. And then the remainder uh, 21 credits, uh, it could be doctoral research credits uh, with your advisor's approval. Um, and they may ask you to take a certain um, course as well to uh, fulfill any knowledge gaps that you may have for either doing the research or um, to prepare for the qualifying exam. Um, other requirements uh, would include uh, six residence unit as well. That is a, um, a course that will automatically put you into full-time status. Uh, it's a residency requirement for our PhD students. Uh, you do get two of them from having a master's degree in place. And then you'll also complete two semesters of TAing. Um, and then you have to uh, pass the qualifying exam in your second year of studies. Next slide, please. Looking into a five-year uh, degree progress uh, plan over here. Uh, so on average, students complete the uh, doctoral degree in five or six years. Um, primarily in your first year, it will be between uh, completing your curriculum requirement and doing research outside of um, the class time. If you're not in class, uh, you should be in the lab doing research. Uh, in your second year, uh, you're finishing off your coursework requirements. Uh, you're also continuing doing your research. And this is also the time where you're doing uh, preparing for your qualifying exam. It takes place once a year. Uh, you start preparing in the fall semester. And then uh, having your oral presentation and also your written exam in the spring semester. In your uh, 
third year, uh, you would have uh, starting to, to complete your TA requirements. Uh, so sometimes students would start doing their TA in their second year uh, for one semester and then doing a second uh, TA uh, assignment for the third year. Uh, and then in the fourth year, you start collaborating with your PI on your thesis proposal. After your thesis proposal, uh, you'll start working more on your um, dissertation. Uh, when you do your pres uh, your dissertation, defense would depend on uh, both in collaboration with your PI and also on your research um, progress. So sometimes students may do their defense in year six instead of year five. It all depends on the type of research that you're involved with and your progress on your dissertation. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to hand it over to our PhD candidate, Ms. Cameron Park, to share about her student experience in the program. Hi, I'm Cameron. Um, I'm a second year PhD student, um, originally from outside Boston. Um, so I'm just going to give you kind of like a little background about what it might be like if you were to be here. So for coursework, um, Helen gave a really great intro to kind of the different courses that you have to take. The last like year or two were a little bit odd with the pandemic and so a lot of it was over zoom um, but now that we're starting to get in person it's a really great way like through courses to know faculty um, and get a lot of breadth so my lab is really focused on um, bioinformatics and computational biology and so taking other classes um, in other topics has been really helpful to kind of get a better idea um, of how like interdisciplinary bme can be um, it's also a great way to like meet different people in your classes that you might not see in your lab um, who might be in different labs. Uh, and like, again, the whole program is so collaborative, both through research and in coursework. And that's been really awesome um, as a student and as a researcher to kind of help build my own skills and my own skill sets. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so a little bit about my lab and research. Uh, my project is using machine learning to determine cell interactions in the tumor microenvironment. Um, this is a picture of our lab. We're a relatively new lab. Um, El Hamazizi became a PI um, about two years, a year and a half ago. Um, it's been very cool to be a part of the lab and kind of build it up from the ground. We've all kind of gotten projects that we've been able to lead, which has been really awesome, especially as a younger PhD student. We have a lot of collaborations with other labs. Um, I think kind of the, the, the big thing that BME as a program really stresses is how interdisciplinary it is. And you experience that firsthand with your collaborations. So we have um, collaborations with multiple labs both in the BME department, in the biology department, um, in, in the CS department. Um, there's a student in our lab, in our lab, who's co-advised with someone in the statistics department. So there is like a huge chance to um, get, again, a lot of breadth, a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration, um, which is really awesome. You can go to the, the next slide as well. Um, yeah, so a little bit about student life and extracurriculars. Um, go BME is kind of the board that plans a lot of the department events um, for students. I think Naveed will talk a little bit more about that, but we've had, you know, a lot of intramural sports. Um, we're right now in the middle of playoffs, so we have our soccer playoffs and our volleyball playoffs on Sunday. Um, and we also do, we had like a Thanksgiving or fall pie um, meet and greet. We've had happy hours. Um, we did a new PhD student tour at the edge, which is a really cool place in New York um, where you can kind of see the whole city from above. So they, I mean, there's a lot of really great stuff to do in the department. And then also like being in New York City, um, there's so much like really amazing opportunities in the city for, you know, exploring and adventures and things like that. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, these are just some pictures of like a lot of other students in the department. And you really get to know people in your lab, people in your cohort. Um, people, you know, in groups above and below you, and it's a really great community. Everyone's there, you know, really trying to, like, make sure that you succeed and you want each other to succeed, and so, you know, you feel very supported throughout your whole time here, and, you know, I'm only in my second year, and I do feel like um, kind of everyone has my back, and I think that's, like, a really special part of this, uh, of this program as well, and next slide. Um, so I saw some people also ask some questions about housing. Um, Columbia does offer student housing um, and there will be more instructions like when you come about how to enter that and choose your apartment. Um, you know, New York is expensive, but 
they do provide like relatively affordable housing in the city. This is not my not my apartment because mine is kind of messy right now. But this is a uh, one of my friends' apartments, um, and they all you know have kitchens, living rooms, bedrooms, things like that. Um, and you can get furnished or unfurnished. Uh, and next slide. And then I think one of the special things about being at Columbia is you know being in New York City, and I mentioned that a little bit before, but it is such a dense area for trying new things, challenging yourself, um, going to different places, trying new foods. Um, I got really into rock climbing when I joined here. There's so many coffee shops around. Um, there's a lot of bike paths and um, yeah, even just like right in like parks. Um, I thought I wouldn't be able to see as much greenery and if you're really close to Central Park, you're really close to Riverside. So uh, again, a, a high density of just like opportunities in the city, both like right in the Upper West Side. And then if you were to go downtown, there's like even more. Um, so can't stress that enough. Yeah. I think that's the end of mine. You can go next slide. And I think now Naveed is gonna talk more about uh, student organizations. Yeah, um, so Cameron gave a really good uh, introduction, but um, I'm Naveed, I'm a PhD student in uh, Gordano's lab for stem cells and tissue engineering. Um, and so my work is focused on doing, using organs on the chip models to help uh, mimic biology um, in a dish, so outside of a animal model. Um, and I'm also the president of our graduate organization for biomedical engineers. Uh, and so this organization has been around for a while and has had like, you know, a few ups and downs with our different um, interests and focuses of the group. But uh, we're really a group that focuses on academic, social, and philanthropy work. Um, we have a lot of different academic events to help support students applying to fellowships. Um, a number of our students get resources from us on applying for the National Science Foundation Grad Research Fellowship that um, I think Henry mentioned at the beginning, as well as NIH uh, pre-doctoral fellowships as well. Um, we have a variety of different events for uh, preparing for qualifying exams and also other um, milestones in the PhD. Um, we have a number of social events, happy hours, intramural sports, um, we do a lot of brunches and pre-COVID, we did a lot of um, some of these like group activities uh, outside venues. Um, some of these have been reduced and some of them have been kind of shifted to different virtual activities. Um, but we always have, you know, a monthly happy hour and then uh, scattered with picnics during the summer because this is a really nice time to be um, outside in the parks. Um, and then with philanthropy, we always help contribute to the Girl Science Day. Um, and some of the Columbia organized events. So Go BME um, has specific events targeted towards this. And then every year, uh, depending on who the philanthropy chair is of the year, um, we host a number of different uh, organizational uh, benefits. So these kind of are scattered throughout, um, throughout the academic year. Next slide. Uh, next slide. I think it might be frozen. Oh, nice. Okay. So this is our board. Um, as you can see, Cameron's on our board. Um, and we have a variety of different positions, including um, uh, people focused on uh, acclimating international students coming to Columbia, um, and then focusing on our communications efforts, philanthropy, um, and then managing our money because we do get funding from the department, but also focus a lot on uh, engineering specific uh, engineering school funded events. Um, what's really nice about our team is that we really work together towards uh, giving the grad experience the best we can. Um, we have a, a, a variety of our events are hosted really by everyone, but um, in particular, and this is something we didn't do this past year, but we we do a lot to kind of help support the PhD interview weekend, um, where you can like if you're invited for an interview, you can get a good sense of what Columbia is. Uh, what New York City is like, and then also the experiences of every different PhD student. Um, I think everyone has a very different experience, and I think the stage you are in your PhD also really de uh, defines, uh, you know, what you're up to. And so we have a lot of different people who can answer any question you have about Columbia um, in the different contexts. So next slide. Um, yeah, so we have just some annual events we always do. Um, events leading up to the holiday party, the Thanksgiving event. We have a retreat um, every year. And so all of these are for all grad students who are interested in joining. We have a lot of master students as well. So we have 
master's student specific events um, also scattered throughout the year. Um, and the next slide. Cameron touched on the intramurals. Um, this has just come back this year since last year. We had a lot of uh, limitations with COVID. Um, with the virtual format, though, we've done um, div like alternative uh, formations of some of these events. Um, and then, Cameron, I don't know if you spoke about this, but um, we have an event in collaboration with the electrical engineering department um, happening in just two days. And that's like a bike event around New York City. So there's a lot of like fun ways to um, get involved with not just the department, but other departments as well. Um, and then we do have a bunch of events kind of scattered throughout New York City. And I think those are the events that people enjoy the most. And so if you're uh, coming here in the fall, we have like a, it's, I'm going to say it's a tradition because we just had it for the first time this year, but um, a nice scavenger hunt around the city and people really enjoyed that. So that's something you can also experience if you come to Columbia. The next slide. Um, and then, like I, I mentioned just briefly, the engineering school itself hosts a number of different events. And uh, pre-COVID, it was like, I think, three or four events a week. Like, we, they hosted a lot of events just for uh, master's students, but also PhD students. A lot of these events were just open to um, everyone. And for the most part, first years really take advantage because, one, you most of the PhD students live close to campus. And then also, um, this is a really nice way to meet people and make friends. And so um, there's a lot of opportunities, like every day there's another, like they, they used to send a lot more emails. And now I think it's like maybe one or two events a week, just depending on COVID limitations. But I think that should, uh, that should change over the next year. Um, but yeah, next slide. I think that's uh, Julie. Thank you, Naveed. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Julie, and I am the admissions operations officer here at SEAS. Um, and we're going to talk about the admissions, the requirements, and the admissions criteria today. Um, thank you. As far as requirements go, um, you're going to first complete an application online, which you can find on our website. We're going to require you submit official copies of your transcripts from all in institutions you have attended with your application. Um, you're going to need three letters of recommendation. In previous years, we have required GRE scores. Um, however, it's going to be optional for the 2022 applications. Um, we also ask that you submit your personal statement, your resume, as well as TOEFL IELTS, or Duolingo scores for students who have attended institutions outside of the US. Um, we have an application fee of $85 upon submission of your application. Um, keep in mind that the priority deadline for doctoral program is December 15th. Okay, next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, here is a more detailed application deadline timeline. Um, you can also find this on our website, so no need to memorize this information, um, but we have a little timeline for you here. Okay, next slide. So um, now here at Columbia Engineering, we're serious about academics, but we also value uh, building community among our students, faculty, and staff. Um, we have many student organizations on campus for you to get involved in. Um, some examples include the Engineering Graduate Student Council, or EGSC, which serves as a student government. Um, the Society of Women Engineers geared towards women in STEM. Um, we have groups focused on industry and research, as well as interest-based clubs. We encourage everyone to join one or more of these groups. We believe it really enhances the graduate experience. Next slide. Um, we also host and support many graduate students' socials so that our students can have a chance to really get to know their peers in a social setting. Um, the Office of Graduate Student Affairs um, has organized trips to Broadway shows, um, sporting events, and other social events both on and off campus. Um, COVID has impacted this a little bit, but GSA still continues to host um, these types of events. 
simply with the inclusion of masks and vaccine, uh, vaccine requirements. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Helen, but feel free to reach out to us with any questions via email. Um, you can email us at csgradmit at columbia.edu. Um, and you could also follow us on social media accounts. Um, we'd love to chat with you and we hope to see you on campus soon. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about our department specific uh, PhD uh, interview process. First, uh, can you go to uh, my slides? Thank you, right there would be great. Um, so we offer both an MS, PhD and PhD only uh, degree track for our doctoral program. So if you have a MS degree in place at the start of the um, doctoral program, you should apply to our um, PhD only program. If you don't have a master's degree in place at the start of the doctoral program, you should apply to our MS PhD program instead. Um, the difference is really in terms of the curriculum requirements that uh, you will have to complete. Uh, so MS PhD students will have a um, more of a course load at their uh, first year and second year of studies with us, whereas our PhD only students, uh, they'll be having more time um, doing research at the time of uh, matriculation. Uh, so all uh, admitted doctoral students, whether or not you're MS, PhD, or PhD only, you do have your tuition and health insurance covered along with a monthly stipend. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, in terms of um, the admission process, uh, we do utilize a match-based admissions. And that means um, your admission into our doctoral program is really driven by uh, your research interest and the faculty's research, along with the um, uh, opportunities and funding available uh, regarding to that uh, faculty. Uh, and at the beginning of the uh, program, you start right off with that faculty uh, uh, that you are admitted into. And you can take a look at our list of core faculty, uh, joint faculty, and affiliate faculty on our department's website, bme.columbia.edu. And on the homepage, uh, as you can see from the yellow circle there, uh, Right there, it will have a link to um, that says meet our faculty and it will lead you to a PDF um, directory of the uh, faculty uh, that's affiliated with the BME department um, and along with a snapshot of the research that they are involved with. Uh, you should also indicate uh, your interest in working with which faculty in your application with us. Next slide, please. Uh, so overall, the timeline is that you should uh, submit your application by December 15th. Um, our faculty starts reviewing these applications right after that deadline. And in June to April, we do select candidates for um, interviews. Uh, so you may receive an invitation from the faculty who's interested in your candidacy um, to meet with them and talk about um, your interest and your background. Um, uh, we do have an interview day in February 18th, um, 2022. So that's next year on a Friday. Uh, so mark your calendars, uh, make sure that you have that day blocked off in terms of um, an opportunity that uh, you may be interviewing with um, a set of our faculty members. Uh, we do roll out the first round of admission decisions in March, uh, but that does not mean uh, that you may not receive an interview um, afterwards. Uh, there will be uh, times where faculty have um, uh, uh, new fundings available or in terms of uh, more positions open. Uh, so definitely, we will have additional interviews after February, but um, those would be dramatically less compared to our uh, February interview day. Uh, final decisions will be rolled out in April and May. Uh, we do 
ask if you are interested in being considered for our MS program only, if you have applied to our MS PhD uh, program track. Uh, you can also indicate that in your application, there is a question asking whether or not you would like to be considered for MS um, only program if you do not receive a favorable admission uh, decision for our doctoral program. Uh, we do send an email to reconfirm this with you um, around March as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we are very active on social media, Facebook. Instagram and Twitter. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities, speakers and uh, workshops that are open to the public uh, and prospective students. On um, our Instagram, uh, we also have a, um, a reel uh, talking about a day in life as a PhD student. Uh, we also have a student profile spotlights uh, called BME Blaze that we interview our alumni uh, from different degree levels in terms of how their experience is with the program and also um, how Columbia BME impacted their career. Um, and so those are really great channels to follow us on and check it out. Um, if you do have more questions or want to set up a meeting with me, I will be sending out a follow-up email after uh, today's info session. Uh, you'll be able to schedule an appointment with me or reach out to me via email uh, and chat more about our program. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that, it concludes our presentation portion today for the info session. And now we're gonna move on to the Q&A 